Douglas is going to go. Uh, goodminds.com is proud to present 13 Moons, 13 Reads, showcasing Indigenous authors, poets, and illustrators from right across Turtle Island with the cultural teachings of the 13 Moons on Turtle's Back. I am the host, Janet Rogers. I'm Mohawk Tuscarora, uh, transmitting to you from Six Nations of the Grand River. And it's a great honor to be here. And I'm very excited uh, for today's very special guest. Uh, we're going to learn about Nika Giza's moon, which is the current moon we're in right now. We're going to learn from Debbie Beach Ducharme. Debbie is Ojibwe from Lake Manitoba First Nations, also known as Dog Creek and Treaty 2 Territory. So welcome, Debbie, and thank you for your good teachings. In my Anishinaabem Win language, I'd introduce myself as Earth Woman, uh, also known as Deborah Beach Ducharme. I'm from, I'm a band member of Lake Manitoba First Nation. I belong to the Bear Clan, and I just, in my language, said I'm happy to be here today. Today, I'm going to share some information with you about uh, 13 Moons uh, calendar. And the way the 13 Moons calendar works is for many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, the turtle's back or the upper shell is a lunar calendar. We don't hear too much about our way of understanding the seasons and the months and the days. This was all taken away from us a long time ago. But now elders pass this information on from generation to generation. We're able to talk about it again. So this is our one way of um, ensuring our worldview is maintained and brought down from one generation to the next. This is our way of dating seasonal changes and all the natural events that occur during each season. In our community, there are four seasons, there are four directions, and this is how we understand the earth and the world around us. There are, are 13 scutes on the turtle's back, as well as 28 smaller scutes on the upper shell. The 13 large scutes represent the 13 moons. The 13 moons occur during one calendar year. The 28 small scutes represent the days of the month. The turtle shell has the same pattern as the moons in a year and the days in a lunar moon. So we understand that the moon takes 13 days to orbit the earth, and this is called a lunar moon. One year, 365 days, there are 13 lunar moons. So it, how it works is the moon completes 13 lunar cycles through the seasons. After each full moon, a small scute is counted until the next full moon, which is 28 days later. It takes exactly 28 days to go from full moon to full moon, which is one lunar cycle. The pattern repeats itself 28 days and completes 13 lunar cycles through the seasons. Each moon is given a name for an important event that occurred during this lunar moon. Moons can change and vary from group to group, depending on the language, depending on the climate, the terrain, or import, important events that occur in that community. At the beginning of each moon, stories are told about the events that occur since the last full moon. And these stories are teachings that are never forgotten once they're told. These stories are passed down from one generation to the next generation. This is how our people ensured that we would never lose this information. The moon we are going to be talking about is Nikigizis. Nikigizis happens in the spring. This moon happens in the spring because it's the time when the summer birds return to our territory. The return of the geese reveals to us that spring is on its way. The coming of this moon represents the beginning of a new year. And that concludes the teaching uh, for this month. And stay safe. I will see you again. Miigwech. So we're going to say miigwech, Debbie, um, for the teachings uh, about the Nika Gizis, which is the goose moon. And the moon for this time we uh, see is a return of the geese. And that tells us that spring is on its way. Happy to see that. Remember, the coming of this moon represents the beginning of a new year as well. Now, we are going to introduce our new special guest for this moon, Katharina Vermette. And here's a little bit about her. 
Katharina Vermette won the Governor General's Award for English Language Poetry in 2013 for her collection, North End Love Songs. Katharina is Métis and originates from Winnipeg, Manitoba. She was an MFA student in creative writing at the University of British Columbia and has also written for the documentary film, The River. She is the author of the graphic novel series, A Girl Called Echo. And the fourth book in that series is titled Road Allowance Era. And that's the book that we're going to be discussing today with Katharina. Katharina has also authored uh, the books, The Girl and the Wolf, River Woman, The Break, North End Love Songs and Seven Teachings. And uh, let us know if you'd like a, a if you'd like to, us to know anything more about yourself, Katharina, feel free to introduce yourself <laughs> as you will. Oh gosh, um, Tanshia Kia. Um, I'm slowly, very awkwardly learning Michif. So Tanshia Kia is what um, I, my my teacher had told me. Um, and I am coming to you from Winnipeg and facing the Red River, just a few houses down over my neighborhood here and um, really, really happy to be here. Happy to see your face, Janet. Indeed, yeah, me too. We, we, we know each other <laughs> through, you know, the beautiful writing community, the indigenous writing community that spans the, the whole, all of our territories. And it's, the, it's, it's wonderful, you know, when we used to be on the road, everyone used to be on the road, reading and traveling and doing um, those uh, author gigs. And uh, at least we have this, this uh, internet now that helps to connect us and keep us connected. Um, I want to start off by saying that, you know, besides the long list of celebrated books that Katharina has in her catalog, which we have uh, shared with you uh, through the introductions, Katharina was part of an Aboriginal Writers Collective out of Manitoba. And did you not, my dear, co-edit uh, the anthology titled XXX India? <laughs> And I don't, I mentioned this because I not, not to embarrass you or I or any, anybody else who appears in this book. It is a book of Indigenous <laughs> um, erotica writing. Um, but I wanted to share with the viewers like the breadth, the scope and the diversity of your writing ability. And I just would like to uh, know if you could tell us a bit about the collective and also about the collection uh, that this book comes from. Um. XXX was, um, it's a funny thing to say, uh, that is almost 10 years old now. I just, like, it came out in 2011. That's amazing. Um, I joined the um, Indigenous Writers Collective, what was then the Aboriginal Writers Collective in 2004, and I was just a young mom just dreaming about poetry, and um, I always say the magic is real. My first ever meeting, we had a writing exercise and I was asked as the, the newbie to pick the theme and I picked the theme of happy. We should all write something happy because we were all of course writing depressing things at the time because we're writers, we write about depressing things. Um, and that the writing that came from that exercise was my first ever published poem, Happy Girls, which was published like the next year in Prairie Fire. So I say the magic of community is real. That, that group, Really, um, it's just made up of so many precious people. Um, and we really just, they really taught me everything that I needed going forward. You know, they had already been putting together chapbooks and putting together gigs. And then after a few years of being involved, I, I um, decided to take the helm of this erotica idea that someone had I don't want to I don't want to name names it was probably Rosanna I don't want to name names <laughs> but <laughs> maybe it was Duncan I don't know but someone said we should write some erotica so away we went and it was it was a brilliant collection I'm amazed at the kind of the the the, the pieces that 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 got submitted for it and um some of them is uh you know very erotic very x-rated and some of them like my stuff is a little more pg-13 so there's something in it for everyone still in, it's still in a few libraries here and there too i think yeah good i'm glad to hear that because it was a it's a really you know it's a great collection it's very rare and it's no longer in print so that makes it even more special yes <laughs> yes you know hard and, to keep things in print <laughs> yeah and before we get into discussing the graphic novel and the new um, uh, volume that is included in that graphic novel, I wanted to go back to uh, 2016 with uh, your novel, The Break. And, you know, I absolutely think uh, that uh, one of the review blurbs from the Winnipeg Review really, really nailed 
nailed it. They seem to understand your writing and the uh, level and the quality of your writing. Uh, they say, the break doesn't read like an impressive first novel. It reads like a master stroke of someone who knows what they're doing. Bromet is a skill, is skilled at writing with a language that is controversial and comfortable and with a poetic ease that makes the hard things easier to swallow. And what I wanted to ask is um, for you to tell us about those hard things. What are some of the hard things that they're referencing and that you choose to write about in your writing? Um, that was a great quote. I don't think I've ever heard that quote. Awesome. I like that person. Uh, <laughs> um, that The Break was a really difficult book. It was my first novel. It was something that I think I was probably writing for about 10 years. It is about the legacy of sexual violence in and outside of, um, you know, my community specifically. Um, it is the idea of how it kind of plays with plays with is the wrong word the story is about a family and it centers around a violent assault and it's how every person has something to contribute to the healing and also every person has something to contribute and something to relate to the trauma of, of that assault one of the women is recounting all of the incidents of sexual assault that she's she's witnessed or bore, bore witness to the course of her life and really experience seeing what is called vicarious trauma or, you know, and really spiraling down that unfortunate rabbit hole. It, as you can tell by that synopsis, it was not an easy book to write. Um, and I understand that it's probably not always an easy book to read. It was something I was really compelled to do. It was something that I took care to do properly or as properly as I could. I really wanted to talk about how even though as Indigenous women, as Métis women, the characters are, are Métis women, even though we are so often victimized by these things, we are also the ones at the forefront of the healing and we are the ones that can guide forward. I really wanted to make the aunties and the mums and the, and the, the kukum and granny in the story really be the leaders of this healing, um, I, I really, and that was for me too, that was through the course of, of writing this, this story that came to me as an idea that I just had to figure out for so many years. Um, really, it, it became about them and how they were leading me, leading me forward and leading me with that healing. So I did try to cram as much hope and love as I could in there. I do try to cram as much hope and love as I can in things, but I don't think we, um, I don't want to, I, I mean, everyone can do what they need to do in their own healing and their own journey. But for me, I don't want to shy away from the difficult things. For me, I want to figure out a way to be able to discuss them and, and not, not stay there, but like move up, move outward of that. You know, one of my very dear friends, who is also our birthday sister, me and Janet share the same birthday. And, and, and so does my friend uh, Kona, who taught me this. And she says, as a storyteller, traditional or otherwise, your duty is might be to go through a, a, a hard story and, and go through a difficult story. But as a storyteller, your, your job is to journey through that and into the other side. You can't just leave people in the middle of the hardness because that's harmful. You have to show them a way to the other side. So that's really the, the guiding. I think that's something I think about whenever I sit down to write something and plan something out as I I really want to find a way forward for myself. And then hopefully that can translate to, for other folks as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Very, very great points. I think we've, we've come to learn that it's necessary to do that, to, that, that is, you know, part and parcel of the responsibility that we have as storytellers and ambassadors of our culture and our nations. And so mm -hmm. you, found, you have found a really great way of uh, bringing us through that hardship into a place of, um, well, responsibility, you know, from, uh, from your own voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well done. Well done, Katharina. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that, you know, the graphic novel series Katharina has penned is titled A uh, Girl Called Echo. And again, putting females in the forefront. So good on you for that. <laughs> Um, and the story that we're focused on today is the fourth in the series that is titled Road Era Ally uh, Era or Road Allowance Era, sorry, by High Water Press. And in this story, you bring the reader back into 1885, 
And that's a time with lots of teepees and river, red river carts that are dotting the landscape. And that was the time when uh, Louis Real was on trial for apparent treason. Um, and he's so iconic to the Métis people, you know, one of the, one of the first leaders, if not the only leader representing for Métis people. And, you know, I'm just wondering what it was like to create dialogue for someone who is so iconic with Métis people. What was, what, did, what kind of like weight of responsibility was attached to that, Katharina? Oh, I felt so much responsibility diving into the history. Um, this whole series, like just to, to briefly talk about A Girl Called Echo, this is the fourth in, in a four part series. And I really walked um, Echo, the, the, the protagonist, the, the girl, um, she's a time traveler and she's been able to visit all these um, amazing periods of Métis history um, and leading unfortunately to the um, trial and execution of Louis Riel. Um, who is one of our great leaders. I think we've had, you know, quite a few great, amazing leaders. Um, a lot of what I did for, it was really daunting to talk about the history, particularly real life people, because these are real life people with families who are still in existence. Like there's so much connections to, um, to our icons and Gabrielle Dumont is no different than, than Lou Riel. There's still family there. There's still people and, and a responsibility to do, um, to be respectful to, to those gentlemen. Um, so for a lot of Louis, Louis' dialogue and Gabrielle's before him, um, I really took the documented words that they had. So all of the, the words that um, appear went, um, in the Louis trial scenes, those are actual his, his words from the trial. He, he spoke at length when he was finally allowed to speak. He spoke at length about his, his people and the history of the Métis people and what he was trying to do. And as they were trying to declare him insane, which they eventually unfortunately did, he spoke so eloquently in a language that was not his own. English was not his first language. Um, and he spoke so beautifully about this land and our responsibility to this land and our connections to this land, not only as Métis people, but as all people. Um, and so I was, so I had just spoils to choose from. He said so many amazing things. So I was able to take all of that. Um, and everything else, I really looked at um, oral histories. There was a lot of recorded oral histories from, um, from grandmothers and um, Gabriel Dumas actually also orated um, a couple of books also. So he, he was able to, so I was able to, you know, have his words guide me as well uh, whenever possible. Um, and yeah, there's, um, there's some great texts out there. There's some great writers and historians that are doing amazing work. Jean Tellette, who is the great grandniece of Louis Riel and a, and a lawyer, a, um, a land claims lawyer out of um, Toronto, I believe. She just um, wrote a book called The Northwest is Our, this, the Northwest is Our Mother. It's the story of Louis Riel's Métis people. So it's a very comprehensive history that really came at a, and she published it at like the best time for me when I was writing this book, because I was able to just use so much of her research and so much of her work. And I thanked her immensely for that book. I think it's an amazing book um, and so long awaited that um, a Métis person has written our Métis history. So, so, so can, so much. Lovely. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And yeah. yes, um, I know too, when I have looked at some historical um, oratory that, the poetry is written right in there. It's embedded, you know, mm -hmm. we, we speak so passionately about our connection to the earth and what our relationships are to our land and things like this. And you have done the same thing. There is poetry that even seeps through in the graphic novel, Katharina, if I may, um, that you're speaking about blood memory and bone memory. And, and I would like to know what you mean by that. Well, my, my teaching, the teaching I've received of blood memory and bone memory is that idea that no matter what our ancestors went through and their strengths and, and their, their trauma is, is within us. And a lot of the, the scientific, the scientific research into it has been into, there's been extensive research into intergenerational trauma and the idea that what has happened before us also affects us, not only through behaviors of the people who are raising us, um, but also through, through our own physiological makeup, 
you know, what is what has happened to our grandparents is also within us. Um, but also the extension of that, the extension that I've been taught is that blown, bone memory and blood memory is not just about the bad things, it's also about all the strengths. So it's what we carry, we carry our ancestors with us, we carry all of their strength, everything that's happened to them, but also all of their gifts that they bring forward into the world. So the Girl Called Echo series is a, you know, this time traveling young girl who finds out she's actually visiting her ancestors as she travels back to these points in time. So then in the end, she realizes that everything they've gone through, you know, as a time traveler, she's also now gone through them with her, with them, but also you no, know, even without that, they're still within her and all of those accomplishments and all of those, um, all of that power is, is culminated in her, you know, because she is, you know, she's eight generations after when she first started traveling so um, that's what I understand bone memory and blood memory to be I know that um, teachings differ um, but I really look at it like that you know we have all of that inside of us already no no matter what yeah and I take great comfort in that also yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah and you know I like the way that uh, through the graphic novel story you're bringing us back in time as you know, through the character who has the ability to travel back in time and learn all of these things. And then she brings those teachings into a contemporary school um, classroom setting. And I'm wondering if, if mm -hmm. it, she's bringing you know, all the truth of the, the history that's happened. And I'm wondering if that's what you actually see happening in classrooms today. Is that is the truth of the Métis history being taught in classrooms? Um, for the most... <laughs> Hopefully, yes, always. But I think, I mean, I, I, there's always discrepancies between histories and what, what teachers understand. Um, I know a lot of the true Métis history is being taught um, more so now than even 10 years from now. Like it's, it's always changing. You know, history is not, history as a class is not like a stagnant point. You know, history teachers are constantly um, adapt, uh, updating their, their resource material and historians are constantly undercover, uncovering new things. Um, and history, and now we have, we're at a point, and I think this is, this is somewhat true for, for all indigenous nations, but for Métis people, we're really just starting in the last 20 years or so to have Métis historians really being at the forefront of, of Métis, Métis, Métis historical knowledge. And that's not always been true because like many indigenous nations, it's been other people telling our histories for us. Uh, so with that change, I think we're just coming into so many different, like just versions of these stories because so many things were missed and lost when, when you know, much of Métis history um, has always been depicted as Métis being the, the aggressors and we're just these savages who attack people for no reason. And of course, that's not true. You know, of course, we had reasons for entering into these armed insurrections that against the Canadian government and um, because they were not honoring our, our ancestral claim to land. Um, it's a very valid reason to fight, I think. Um, and... Yeah, so I think that we're, these things are changing. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm always optimistic. My, my, um, in, the, in the story, in Echo's story, she has indigenous teachers, indigenous history teacher who is telling her the story of the Métis people, the accurate from, from what I can tell story of the Métis people. So again, it's an optimistic story. She, she has a great teacher in at least. Yeah, and, and now there's no excuse with you uh, creating this series of graphic novels. <laughs> there's no excuse not to bring these, these uh, you know, wonderful resource materials into the classroom so that the truth can be taught in the, from, an, from a Métis perspective, you know? So, so very um, subversive and necessary, <laughs> good for you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the, there's always more work to be done wherever possible. And we're, we're kind of compiling the teacher guide right now, too. So we're trying to get all these resources together so that there, yeah, there is no excuse. And I think there's many parts of, and I think in Winnipeg here, we, we know kind of a broader sense of the story and maybe in, in, in Batash and Saskatchewan as well, where there's still predominant Métis populations, but I think the rest of Canada, particularly you, you guys out in the East over there who may not know about the, the Métis history, because I think traditionally Ontario's version of Métis history has been very different right. than what actually happened. Right, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the nomadic aspect 
of the people, you know, makes it far, far spread. And now, so yeah. getting back to your beautiful, excellent poetic voice, I mean, you know, just revisiting again, not to bring that up again, but, but revisiting <laughs> your poems in the XX Indian. Just so I'm, I'm wondering if you would mind <laughs> to, to share, to give us an example of uh, your beautiful poetic skills and voice. Um, I'll read a quick poem just so we won't, I, so we can keep talking. Okay. Um, and this is called, a, <laughs> this is called, a, yeah, we don't want to run out of time. This is called Another Story. This country has another story, one that is not his or hers or ours. It is written in water, carved on earth, every stone a song that echoes the erosion. Hold one to your ear and whispers rise. This country has another story, and it is not his or hers or even ours. It is scrolled on wind, painted in blood. Every bone sings. Hold them to your heart. Those buried voices still rise. Ooh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Katharina, last time Thank I saw you, you was at uh, the University of Alberta when you were reading, introducing um, a new book then, and you had your little baby girl with you who was still- My little her. baby. How old is she now? <laughs> How old is she? she is three and she's still stealing the show. Oh my <laughs> gosh. She's a, uh, yeah, she's a hoot. Three-year-olds are the best. Oh, They're just like the best buddies you can walk around with. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> she's very, very lucky to have a mother, a very talented mother like yourself, who's going to be teaching her all about her Métis reality. So this is wonderful. Thank you very much yes. for joining us today, Katharina. Any last, uh, any other things that you'd want us to want to share with us before we we chat, we say bye? Um, I don't know. I'm just really honored to be here. I'm happy to be talking to you, and just yeah, I hope everyone stays healthy and warm as the spring, as the geese come back, and we yeah. can enjoy yeah. spring. It's the best time of year. It's the best yeah. time of year here in Winnipeg, especially. <laughs> yes, fantastic. Yeah. So thanks again, Katharina. Um, join us in the next moon, the Omakagesis frog moon, uh, as we interview uh, Rebecca Thomas, Joseph uh, Danderan, and Rosanna Deerchild are joining us for um, a National Poetry Month in April. And uh, that will be a wonderful poetry circle. When uh, you, uh, if you're interested in purchasing any of the books, please contact us at goodminds.com. Use the promo code uh, 13 moons 13 reads at checkout to receive free shipping on your next order. Remember to order all of your Indigenous books at goodminds.com. And we thank you for supporting Indigenous books and Indigenous owned businesses. Thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to subscribe, hit the like button and follow us on the Facebook and the Twitter and comment on this uh, video to win a signed copy from our featured guest today. We will see you in the next moon, everybody. Until then, take care, be well, onigawi, and uh, bye for now. <laughs>